Hello everyone, good morning. Welcome to the session Record and Replay API Test Case and Data Mocks Without Writing Code by Neha Gupta and uh, Shubham Jain. So without any further delay, over to you Neha and Shubham. Thank you Nidhi and uh, thank you everyone for showing up. Uh, good morning and good evening because we have people all across the world. So uh, I'm Neha and uh, this is Shubham. Today we are going to talk about, you know, how you can easily use record and replay methodology uh, to, to generate API test cases. So I'm just quickly going to share my screen. I'm just going to tell a little bit about ourselves and uh, uh, we are going to share our journey of, um, you know, uh, automating the testing process uh, in our previous teams at different organizations and how did we land up uh, to a single approach, uh, the pros and cons of different approaches that we tried for, um, you know, the automating the testing process. And at the end, uh, Shubham is going to showcase a demo where, um, you know, he'll be showcasing how you can record and replay and uh, create the API test cases without writing any code. And also, um, he's also going to showcase if you are using Selenium UI tests already um, and you want to use a plugin or an extension to Selenium that can mock your backend, including the infrastructure calls, uh, that is also that what he's going to showcase. Uh, so, yeah, uh, as I mentioned that we are both maintainers of Kiploy, that's an open source API testing uh, platform that virtualizes the infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, previous to this, we were working at, uh, uh, you know, office of CTOs of uh, uh, some Indian SaaS companies uh, like Lenskart and Farai. These are e-commerce and uh, logistics SaaS. And our role um, was, you know, to experiment in every other two weeks. And we were releasing very fast, like almost, uh, um, you know, iterating through the code in, in a single day itself. So um, the team was very small because it was meant to do experiments with new technology, new features, what people are expecting from the that company. Um, and uh, one thing that was very limited was time. We had very strict timelines. And because of the strict timelines, we were able to do very limited testing, um, maybe a couple of happy flows. We wanted to do functional testing uh, more because it was an experimental feature functional test cases should be okay uh, later on scalability things can you know uh, work out we can improve the scalability part and with that limited testing obviously there were introduced regressions so just to uh, you know keep the uh, the the releases same uh, we only wanted three things to automate the testing process. One was, um, you know, to have the functional test cases, something that can, a tool or something that can, you know, uh, bring out the real world scenarios from production and uh, we can test it function, like uh, we can do the functional testing uh, of whatever we are releasing and see if there is a, any regression introduced. And two, uh, we wanted something that with which we can easily write and update the test cases. Uh, it shouldn't be hard because the time is limited, like I mentioned. And three, um, the last was that we needed something that can mock the infrastructure and my input is not required. So all that infrastructure orchestration can be done automatically. That is all we just wanted to move fast. Um, and we explored a couple of solutions. So initially we started with, you know, a simple uh, automation test suite that we write the functional test cases and it should be a good to go that uh, on every release, we write some same amount of test cases and it should be fine. <laughs> but the uh, reality was different because whatever test cases we were writing, um, as you, you know, develop a new feature, or even if you, you know, make changes to the existing feature, those test cases need, need, needed to be updated. So they were very brittle in terms of uh, reliability on, you know, if I can rely on my time consumed versus 
um, uh, the test suite that has that I have already prepared. So uh, that was quite painful. And not only that, when the single microservice talked to multiple other microservices, it became even more painful uh, because there were shared test infrastructure. Uh, by that, I mean that, you know, uh, as a QA, if I've written an automation suite um, and I've set up a test database and, um, you know, uh, the test other microservice, uh, which my application is talking to. Now somebody else comes and uh, uh, uses that same uh, database, test database, like another QA in the team uh, from my team only or the developer who is working on the same application. And they try to test with the same thing and, uh, you know, changes uh, a, li a little bit of records. So that shared database, again, uh, was broken in different scenarios uh, when, when, you know, multiple people are working on the same thing. So again, that was not working out for us, really. It was time consuming, um, but it was, uh, you know, it was brittle uh, as well. So uh, what we planned to do was somebody told us, hey, why don't you test in production? And we were like, uh, hey, are you crazy? Why, why would we test in production? Why would you say that? Uh, it was a very scary thought uh, to be with. So uh, when we actually, you know, deep dive and, uh, uh, you know, explored more about testing in production, it actually made sense. So when we actually talk about uh, testing uh, or automating the testing, we want to create the best possible simulation of production environment at, at the end when we are making a QA environment. Uh, so if, if we can test in production, that's the best case scenario. So uh, we're like, okay, let's explore how people are testing in production today. So uh, we discovered that, you know, people are doing the record replay, the shadow testing part, um, you know, these methodologies like tap and compare. So we explored each and every one of it. I'm going to talk about all those now. Um, so first was, you know, shadow testing that you have a stable application running in production, uh, which is serving traffic request and response. And what you do is for the same application, you create a new deployment uh, version of that application. You deploy it, you do not release it in production. And uh, what you do is you mirror the traffic. Uh, I mean, you duplicate the traffic uh, to the new version of the application in production itself and compare the responses. And if the responses are great, you know, uh, it's good to go. Uh, now, this kind of approach works well if you are using a stateless application like uh, you know audio streaming or something but it doesn't work when your application has dependencies so uh, you know we were confused that uh, with the different microservices even internally that our, our application is going to talk to or uh, third party services how are my um, how how is my application v2 who what is it going to talk to i cannot just make it connect to the production uh, databases right uh, all the post and put calls uh, delete calls all, all the mutations will fail right um, uh, so we are really curious how are people doing that and we really discovered that some people are actually connecting their uh, application new version uh, to the production database itself. And we were like blown away. How is that possible? So we discovered more. Now, uh, what happened with uh, the limitation with this was that your API request needs to be idempotent. Uh, if you guarantee the idempotency in your APIs, then it means that you can use this approach. Uh, by idempotency, I mean that if you do the same request twice, the initial behavior of the, uh, resp the, of the dependency should not change. For example, if I say that an API, uh, like update the balance to rupees 200, uh, then 
it's an item put in request. But if I say the existing balance is 100, but plus 100 in the balance, then it is a non item put in request. But because if it is done twice, the balance would be updated from 100 to 200 and to 300 then. So our um, APIs were non item put in. Uh, so we went on to exploring more approaches. And then we discovered that, uh, uh, you know, what people are doing is that you filter out the reads from uh, the get APIs from production. Uh, the get APIs read from the database and you compare the results. And for the right APIs, you do the testing locally or, you know, write, continue with the automation scripts. Uh, but we were not satisfied because, um, you know, get APIs were fine to test, but post APIs were even more important. So we went on to exploring more approaches. Um, and we, uh, you know, thought of creating this shadow database, you know, uh, that if we have a production database, why not create a, you know, a replica of it, uh, the database dash uh, and this replica would be kept in sync in real time that, uh, uh, you know, if you are serving a request here, the database uh, call would be made and all these changes would be reflected here. So you might have figured out that the limitation with this was initially it was, it was sounding like a good idea, but the limitation is that when you replay the same request here as well as here on the application V2, um, there is a replication lag between database and shadow database. So um, let's say, you know, if you're making a mutation call here, it is replicating while this duplicated request is also trying to make the same change. Um, you might get a different result with that. And uh, uh, in some times, uh, based on the parallelity, uh, in some times you might get the same response and you might be able to compare it but in many times you might not be able to get it. So it was not really a sound approach in that case. Also, it was expensive to keep the, you know, databases uh, replica and keep maintaining them uh, in real time. So uh, not a very uh, sound approach to go ahead with. Uh, so what we did was we thought that why in real time, if replication lag is a major problem, how about we create something like a shadow database in later in uh, like in real time, but uh, we test it later in time. So uh, we thought of testing it later. And what we did was creating a database snapshot to a non-production environment. Uh, so it was like you are replicating the production test simulation to a non-production environment. Uh, and uh, there was a shadow database we tried to replay so we recorded this these user traffic uh, api calls all the uh, which, which was served to application v1 and we replayed that to application v2 um, and we were expecting it to work it did really work well uh, but the problem was eventually the shadow database gets out of date uh, from the production database, then you have to do all that operations. Um, so it was very operational heavy approach that you have to record, you have to replay, you have to uh, keep the sh shadow or snapshot DB uh, maintained. So uh, later on, it will start breaking if you don't maintain it. So uh, I, I mean, that was a very operational heavy and expensive approach. So we didn't go ahead with it. And uh, that's when we thought of creating a virtual database. But before that, I'm just going to summarize. So what we did was, uh, so far, we understood that testing in production is good. What are the pros with the record replay methodology that it's a low code approach that you can easily replay your real world traffic to your new version of application and um, see how it is going to work. Uh, the edge cases are not really covered, uh, but it gives a good coverage because you discover new scenarios and um, you go through all those, uh, you know, API test cases or, or uh, 
the different use cases that your users are performing on the application in production. So you get the coverage easily covered, uh, some good amount of coverage. But the cons were that, um, you know, one, the dependency states, the infrastructure is not that easy to mock or to, um, if, if it is, uh, you know, you're creating a shadow database or um, any mock, you need to maintain that very regularly. So that was causing flakiness in the test cases. That was a problem. And this kind of approach was suitable for load test that you want to record and replay somewhere a certain amount of traffic and you see how your application is behaving under high load. Uh, but for functional test cases, it was not that good because if any of the API starts failing, then all the user traffic calls on that API starts failing and you have to debug each and every API call, which is very hard to do because there are so many. Uh, so if it could be reduced to a few number, it is a good functional test uh, approach as well. And uh, you know the rights and mutations are very tricky to handle. So we were here, uh, the shadow database or uh, the snapshot DB, I would say, the snapshot DB uh, approach, it was kind of fine, but not long lasting. So we moved ahead with the virtual database that I was talking about. Um, now with virtual database, what happens is when you record the API calls, you record the stubs of this database or any of the dependency that your application is talking to in production. Um, I'm just going to give an example with it. And, um, you know, this virtual database approach is finally what we went ahead with. Uh, for example, if I'm recording a production environment request, let's say, get games for user Thompson. And this application is talking to Mongo database, reading two tables and getting me the games that user Thompson's play. Uh, all this is recorded from production. Now, when you right now do it in test environment, um, you re replay the same request, get games for user Thompson and the new version of the application and your test database is, re, uh, is there in the test environment, but user Thompson doesn't exist. So the uh, application response is going to be different. You cannot just directly compare it and uh, say that, okay, uh, you know, my test suite or record replay is automated. So how do we really do that? Um, so the, by virtual database, I mean that uh, you know, when you record this production environment call, you record this uh, and stub of Thompson, cricket, volleyball, carom, and boxing. Uh, and when you replay it, uh, you just provide this these entries as a database instead of, um, you know, um, making a complete database or setting up that or writing a data mock like a, a JSON or something. Uh, you don't really need to do that. And, and that's what Kepler also does, that it mocks this or any other test service or any other microservice that your application might be talking to here. And it just returns the same thing uh, to the application, just like a production environment um, dependency would do. And see, try to see that how would your application behave um, if it got the same response? is there any regression introduced? So if your application responds the same way it was responding in production, um, then we are good to go for that test case. So um, this is how you know the virtual database or the virtual uh, test infrastructure could be done easily while you know recording and replaying and not, not uh, really needing to set up the test environment. Uh, now, Shubham is going to talk about architecture and uh, how Kiploy is doing it. And, uh, um, you know, we'll also showcase a demo. Over to you, Shubham. Thank you, Nia. Um, yeah, coming to the architecture, as Nia mentioned, what we had settled with is once you install the Kiploy SDK into your application, everything, uh, every incoming and outgoing call is going to be recorded, right? So that's going to be along with, uh, so let's say when once you make the API request, uh, those get recorded 
along with all the infrastructure calls. Those could be the databases, or it could be the caches, or it could be external or internal microservices. Um, and once that is captured, like since we're capturing all the infrastructure calls, uh, those can be replayed anywhere. It can be replayed in your CI environments. It can be replayed locally. Um, it can be replayed in any test environment if if that's needed. And we can pick and choose what we want to mock and what we don't want to mock. So that is one of the uh, interesting things of this platform. So you don't need a whole test environment. You want to mock the entire environment and just test the application under test. You can do that. If you want to mock certain things, which are very hard to replicate in your test environments, you can do that. Right? So that way your tests and um, the system under test is tested really solid. And now quickly, um, I'll walk you all through the demo. To install Keploy, you can just go to GitHub. And Keploy is open source. So you can feel free to uh, you know clone this repository and you can use Docker Compose up. We also have a binary. But to use a binary, you will also have to install Mongo. So using uh, you, if you're using Docker, then that's an easier way to spin up the Keploy instance locally. If you want to run it, let's say in a large um, Kubernetes cluster, then we also have an option of um, you know using a Helm chart where you can install it in 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 Kubernetes. So I currently already have Kepler running locally. So basically, once you clone it, all you have to do is Docker compose up, and that should spin up Kepler for you. In case, I mean, if you're one of the contributors like me, then you can obviously uh, use the uh, developer compose, which helps you, you know, which helps you make local code changes. And then you, I mean, uh, make that reflect in your uh, Kepler installation. Once you do that, uh, you can open localhost 8081. And that's where Kepler will be running. We have two sections, test cases and test runs. Uh, in, in test case, you can see on this side, we have different test suites. Um, in your case, this might be empty when you when you first install Kepler. So um, yeah, you'll have to first create a test case and then you know you would have test cases as well as test runs. Now to create a test case, you'll have to install the SDK. Currently, we have full support for Go. And we also now support um, many functionalities in Java as well as JavaScript. In fact, one thing which I'm also going to show is we also have a Selenium extension, which works, um, which inserts the JavaScript SDK into the front end in runtime. So I'll be showing that, but before that, I'll first quickly show how we can generate API test cases. So for that, we'll be using a sample Go application. You don't have to write any code. It's just a one-time integration effort that you have to, I mean, anybody in the team can do along with you um, into the code base. So that sample which I'm going to show you is available in the samples go repository. So yeah, that's available here. And once you clone it, uh, it would look something like this, right? To use it, we also need um, to use the, we can use Docker compose up to quickly bring up the Postgres instance, or you could also just, you know, install Postgres locally and use that. Once Postgres is up, the sample application is a URL shortener. It does, uh, it has four methods. So when you do a put, you can put a URL, for example, it could be selenium.com and you can get back the shortened URL. Once you get the shortened URL, it will go back to selenium.com. So that's the basic functionality of a URL shortener. And also you can update that URL. Like you can change, maybe, you know, change the shortened URL to a different URL, or you could delete the URL, right? So, yeah, so let's quickly see how that works. So to begin with, uh, we can quickly, so here I'll be using Hopscotch to quickly, um, you know, show you how this works. I mean, to quickly uh, do all these API requests, you could also use curl or postman what are you comfortable with? And first, let me also start the application.
Perfect. So the application is started, Kepler is running. Now, whatever request I'm going to uh, perform, they will be basically captured along with the API calls. So we are going to do a shortener. First, we'll do a post here. We can post github.com. Um, or in fact, let's just post selenium.com. So selenium.com, that's what we're going to post. We did that. As you can see, we have a timestamp as well as a, a shortened URL. So if I open this shortened URL, this should redirect to Selenium. So this is basically the HTML page. If I just put it here, you can see this goes to Selenium. Now, maybe I want to change the URL. Um, so I can put it here and I can change this to, I don't know, maybe Selenium ID. Right, so a different URL, and I can post that here. Yep, this is also done. Uh, yeah, so rows affected one, and I could delete the URL altogether. Right, so I've performed a bunch of queries. What happens if I try to get something which, you know, for which the, the I mean, if, if I change the shortened URL, invalid URL, right? So that's another case. Now, if I go to Keploy once more, I can see I have the Selenium demo and I have a bunch of these calls captured, right? First is the post that we did, then we did a get, then we updated the URL, we deleted the URL. We also tried to get back the URL and you know it, it was a 404. I can you know, go deeper into these test suites. For example, I can go into the post, I can see the request response, um, all of those details. What's interesting is dependencies, right? So here I can see all the database queries which happen. It's not just a visualization tool to see the, the database queries or your traces, but it's actually going to mock all this database queries in runtime. So I don't need to have the database running when I'm running this test suite against my application. Another thing to note is we can also see uh, an interesting parameter called noise. So timestamp as which, you know, is a time-based variable. So as you can see here uh, in the response, it's always going to be different. So it's automatically flagged as a noisy parameter, which will keep on changing. So when I'm going to do a future test, it automatically gets ignored. You can obviously change this or you can manually annotate fields that you don't want to test. All of that is possible. Now, once this is done, now I can quickly run this test case. To do that, um, I can go to, so I can stop this application. And there's, there are two ways to do it. Either we can set an environment variable or we can also have a test file. So in this case, we made a native integration with GoTest. In case, let's say, if, if you're using a Java application, it would there's a native integration with JUnit. So the benefit is that if, let's say, the developer has written any other test cases, these test cases are going to run along with it. And you'll also be able to see all the code coverage and other details uh, that we are able to see right now with general JUnit tests or with uh, in this case go test so when i'm going to run this along with coverage and yeah i can also shut down my database because i don't need that anymore you can see it there's a five minutes delay just to ensure that the application is instantiated there are seven test cases and all of them have passed i can also see that there's a 70 percent coverage not just that because it's a native integration with go test i can go to file by file and I can see line by line coverage in my ID because IntelliJ or, you know, JetBrains ID is here. I'm using Golang. These natively support um, Go test and JUnit. So basically the green basically shows this line is covered. Red shows it's not covered. Yellow wins, you know, partially covered. So yeah, all of that is also done. Now let's try to do a code change. So, you know, something which will fail a test case. So one way we could do that is we can maybe you know somebody made a mistake or an intentional change they change the ur the url parameter from url to urls as soon as i do this i can run the test case again the test suite
and you can see one of the test cases failing. Now to go into further detail, I could go to the UI to see why you know what really happened. And as you can see, uh, I'll have to refresh this. Yeah, perfect. The second last, I mean the the second is the one which we ran where there was no error. The latest one is on top, and here we we can see one there's a one failed test case. If I go to the failed test case. I can see that I can see a quickly diff that you know what the response instead of URL, I'm getting URL. So you can easily see that's flat. Again, during this testing, uh, during this test cases, I did not need a database to run. All of that was automatically mocked uh, by Kepler. And also, um, you know, if like we talked about the noise parameter, body.th is a noisy parameter. So even though the timestamp is different, it is not flat. Because timestamp is always going to be different. It's always going to be noisy. So yeah, I mean, um, now what if, so this could either be a correct change, basically something that we're expecting, or it could, it could actually be something uh, as a bug, right? So let's say it is something that we're expecting, right? In that case, I can just click on normalizing it. So I didn't have to go and update any test suite. I just have to click and normalize it. Once I normalize it for all future test cases, it's going to be considered URLs as the de facto. So if I go back and I try to, you know, run these tests again, yeah, as you can see, all the tests are passing, right? So um, I can also go and see in my UI. So this particular test, which was failing, now it is URLs, and you know that's the expected and actual response. So everything is working fine. Everything is matching. Um, yeah. So this is on the API testing side, right? So Keploy, if you notice, it's not just testing the APIs. What makes it special is the infrastructure side. Like we are able to record infrastructure calls like databases or external APIs, and we are able to replay that. So we felt, you know what? Let's take this one step further. So we uh started working on a selenium extension so we feel selenium id is a really great um record replay uh tool so we made a selenium extension for that you can um like we are still in the early release and we would love i mean if you would love to try it uh we would love to um i mean you can go to the git repository and if you would like to uh get notified when it is released stably or in public beta, you can uh, go to the Keploy landing page and submit your email here, right? Meanwhile, for the open source version, you can access, you can, you know, clone Keploy. And once you're done, you can go to the Keploy browser extension. The code would be available here, right? And once you clone it, um, you can load it into Chrome. So I'll show you how you can do that. So currently it only supports Chrome, right? Once you have, and you also need to install the Selenium ID. So let's say once you've installed the Selenium ID version three, I know there's also version four coming out. We're working with, uh, you know, the developers of the Selenium ID four to work on the version four plugin. So it's going to be out also along with Selenium V4. So here we'll be using Selenium V3, the Selenium ID V3. And, um, yeah, once you have the ID installed, you can go to um, Chrome. Yeah, so there's a Chrome window. So we can go to Chrome extensions and load unpack extension. And you can go to the, uh, the Keploy plugin directory inside dist. So once you go here, uh, you'll, you can you know, easily uh, load this plugin. So all you have to do is select, and once you do select, the Kepler plugin would be loaded, right? So that's the basic installation. You don't have to change anything in your code. So yeah, one of the benefits here is, while in the backend side, you'll have to insert the SDK, this extension does it automatically. In fact, it doesn't even have to be your own application. I can just, you know, use any application. Right now we support XHR. Uh, once we also support fetch requests, you can literally use any application and you can, um, you know, capture the backend traffic along with capturing all the, uh, Selenium ID extension. So let me show you that. 
So once this is done, uh, let me just close this. Uh, I'll open Selenium ID. So let me create another test suite, or in fact, let me create a new project. Or okay, let's do this. So Selenium fun, right? Once I add this test case, so one thing you notice, you uh, by default you can get an untitled test case. Please don't use that because we need the test ID to map the infrastructure calls to the test cases. So always create a name test, and then we can hit record. Now, just to show what we are doing, I'll go quickly to the network tab, and as you can see, when I'm going to type any query, right? So for each query, there's a new XHR request. I open this. I can, you know. Say OSS is awesome, right? You can see a bunch of API calls happening. And uh, I can go to the next page. Now, once all of this is done, right? I can now stop recording. So one thing again to notice, you should not stop the browser when this happens, right? So always stop recording. If you do it, then we will not be able to save it to the Keploy database. And once this is done, you know, we can all just quickly replay this current test, right? So as you can see, all these API calls which are happening earlier are not happening anymore because that is automatically mocked. So I'm, I'm it's my hands up. It's all doing. It's all using Selenium ID. So I'll just play it once again. So the ID is running the test. It's opening Google.com. It's doing all those key presses. It has recorded everything. The API calls are automatically done by Keploy. So right now it's not talking to Google at all, right? So the use case here is that you can use this along with your, um, you know, so let's say you want to test the front end in isolation. I mean, these calls are basically uh, uh, analytics calls. So you can ignore that. All of the other calls are automatically mocked. So let's say you have your backend and you're using this, uh, you want to test your front end in isolation from the backend. You can easily do that. You want to mock certain APIs, you can easily do that. And all on the fly, you don't have to write any of these. So I hope this uh, gives a good overview of what Keploy can do. Keploy is basically a virtual infrastructure platform, right? To ensure that you don't have to deal with all the uh, uncertainties and um, complexities of test environments. Yep, thanks. I, I hope the demo was helpful. I'll quickly go back to the slide to conclude. So right now, like I said, we have experimental support for Java TypeScript along with Go. So we have full support for Go and we're adding support Java, JavaScript as well as frontends. We have uh, a UI where you can edit and visualize your test reports. We have integration with native test tooling. We can also automatically detect and ignore time sensitive data, which you can obviously edit. Future work. So we're working on contract testing. I think that's going to be interesting. It can help, can help surface a lot of problems. We already, if you think about it, we already support it. It's just, we are going to make that more robust and obvious. Recording from live web events, like I just showed you, right? So make that even easier to use. Um, it could be, let's say a very high throughput environment. So right now, let's say you have millions of requests every day. Uh, recording from the environment requires a lot of performance tuning. So we want to make Keploy scalable enough to handle those situations. We want to make Java TypeScript and uh, basically Java and TypeScript, JavaScript SDK stable along with uh, the Chrome extension. So if, if the Chrome extension looks interesting, the Selenium extension, uh, please, you know, um, I mean, we can, you can stay updated about it by signing up for the newsletter. You can go to Kepler.io. It's right on the front. Um, or you can also just try it locally and uh, be, and you can start our Chrome extension repository. You'll keep on getting updates on that. Also agent implementation, like Nea talked about, you know, there's some, you know, huge advantages of an agent implementation. So we're working how we could work closely with the open telemetry platform to have a great agent imp implementation, which makes installation even easier. So you don't have to make any of those code changes, which I talked about to install the SDK. So recording tests, writing tests is no code, but the integration still requires some code changes. And yeah, generate more tests from existing tests. So if I have a bunch of tests, can I infer that and generate more test cases? So that way we can maybe increase the coverage of our test cases. So that's another use case. 
thank you i hope the presentation and demo was useful it was a uh, really fun presenting and showing what we have been doing at keploid uh, we are happy to take any questions now thanks shubham thanks neha we have few questions in the q and a section so sure. we can take up those so uh, the first question i'm seeing is from uh, is so this replica was also allowing you to access the pi data of customers if not how were you making sure pi data did not get exposed while testing i think great question security and privacy are cornerstones of today's products currently in the open source version i mean keploid is fully open source so currently in in, in keploid um yes i mean everything is captured so that's also going to be pi data that's for sure however we are adding uh, filters where you can annotate data to ensure that you know that uh, access is minimized right so have that kind of access control where people where the data is obfuscated from uh, you know people that you don't want to you, you don't want have access to so yeah that's something that we definitely working uh, yeah thanks for asking the question it's a great question um something that we've been keenly working on uh, another anonymous uh, question how we can edit test case to use data from another test to another so i think the idea is that how can we uh, if we have test data how can we create another test from it so i think that's similar to what we talked about that how to generate more test cases from existing tests so essentially once you have let's say test data and some dependencies you can go and you can edit any test case and you can create a new test case so currently we already support that so you can go and you can edit there's an edit button uh similar to how we normalize there's an edit button which you can use to you know edit that test case um so another question we have is would keploid work with dotnet applications where the underlying apis are not true rest apis and have heavy object passed in the api so the keploid backend like the keploid sdk if you want to test a dotnet application that is not supported yet so we don't have a dotnet sdk yet what however you could do is if let's say you're using the browser extension and you would like to mock a dotnet application and you want to test the front end in isolation that is currently possible so your dotnet your back end could be written in dotnet and um your front end you know which is you know javascript the extension would uh, automatically insert the sdk there and there it is uh, language agnostic and even if the payloads are heavy uh i don't think i i don't see a major problem in in supporting that so if you want to use keploy for mocking your uh mocking your backend from your front end like using with selenium id uh, you could even do that if your application is running dotnet i think another thing is also in case of selenium integration would keploy work in mocking if executing selenium script using test ng and triggered by maven commands i think that's also a great question um we have honestly not tested that outside of selenium in uh, selenium ide so if, for example if you're writing your own selenium scripts we can definitely give uh, an integration where when when whenever you are writing any selenium code like here we were recording it but when we were like writing a selenium code you can record the infrastructure calls in isolation and use an identifier in selenium so that way what's going to happen is whenever you are going to um run that actual selenium code the backend will be um you know handled by keploid automatically right so uh that way you can run it along with your maven commands and your existing ci pipelines thank you that's a great question as well so uh yeah another cool question we have is is it possible to apply load using these cases so i think the question is around load testing um in our case load testing we could like one one potential way we don't support load that load testing right now by the way but one thing that's possible is we could probably uh, export these test cases to uh, ksx or you know jmeter where you could use all of these request for load testing so that is something that we are working on however right now we're not planning to support because uh, to do a large scale load testing there are many things which you know tools like selenium support where you could you know have multiple runners spread across your kubernetes clusters which will uh, you know which can generate a truly high amount of load 
and from different IPs and different user agent strings. So uh, those kind of capabilities, I think, is where tools like A6 would shine. Uh, what we would do is we would, um, you know, allow you to export that so that you can you can choose any load testing platform of your choice and use that. Yep. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. Thanks, Shubham and uh, Neha for the wonderful session and uh, for sharing your experience with us.